This is Durrell, Jersey's famous wildlife conservation trust. Outside, the animals enjoy the sunshine. Inside, one very special creature is being closely watched. Dana, the Sumatran orangutan, is almost ready to give birth. Staff are anxious about the arrival of her baby because Dana's last pregnancy ended in tragedy. Here, Dana and the other apes live safely, but her wild relatives are on the edge of extinction. These orangutans live on the Indonesian island of Sumatra. It's one of their last wild strongholds. They cling on as land is cleared and burned to make way for industry. But with half of the island's rainforest already gone, can they survive? I, I really get sick up of seeing just the, the scale of destruction. I mean, you see fires, you see plantations going in, not just a few trees being chopped down here, but whole landscapes being converted. Dana's keeper, Gordon Hunt, is making the hard journey to Sumatra to see for himself what can be done to help these great apes. He knows it's going to be tough. I'm expecting to see, you know, cages full of orphaned orangutans, which is not great. He's come in search of the refugees of the lost rainforest. Day one, and Gordon's going deep into the jungle. Road? What road? There is no road. It's a boggy ravine, rut, riverbed, mixture of, yeah, no track at all. But this is the only way to get to the orangutan release site in northern Sumatra, where he's going to meet a man who's devoted his life to saving these animals. Today, Dr. Ian Singleton's home is in the jungle, but he was once a keeper at Jersey Zoo. While Gordon wrestles with the rutted roads, his orangutans in Jersey are on his mind. He's got two expectant mums to think about, Annetta and Dana. And just like any pregnant mums, they're having ultrasound scans. Dana's scans are crucial because her last baby was stillborn and she almost died. Luckily, this time, she's in the hands of Jersey Hospital's Neil McLaughlin, consultant gynaecologist. We are still concerned um, as to how she's going to perform in this pregnancy because she's never actually had a live, live born baby before. So we've been watching today on the scan to see uh, if the baby is developing well. Gerald Durrell's intention was never to imprison endangered animals, but to protect them. Captive breeding is now a vital part of the Wildlife Trust's work, because who knows if one day these Jersey-born youngsters will be among the few orangutans that remain. Back in the forests of Sumatra, it's thought there are fewer than 7,000 orangutans left in the wild. They're being pushed to the edge of their habitat as nature and industry compete for space. Here, vast palm oil plantations have replaced the jungle. There are still thousands of hectares of forest, alive with some of the world's rarest species the great Argus pheasant. And one of the biggest forest geckos in the world. At the top of the tree, the orangutans. They are among the world's most critically endangered great apes and protected under Indonesian law. But despite this, many will end up here with Ian at Sumatra's only rehabilitation project in the far north of the island near Medan. Ian takes in rescued and injured animals in the hope 
they can be one day released back into the jungle. The orangutans that come here are, um, you know, they're all mostly confiscated illegal pets. So they're coming from people's back gardens where they've been kept in a cage or chained up by the neck or something like that. Uh, one or two of them have come here because we've, we've had to rescue them from the wild because they were in patches of forest that were being destroyed. And uh, usually if we do that, we'll release them immediately in another safer area of forest. This is Ian almost 20 years ago, looking after the apes in Jersey. The passion to protect them began here at Durrell. In my early zoo career, I, I felt I enjoyed working with the animals and working closely with them and not working with people and being responsible for them. And uh, when I started at Jersey Zoo, I, I really liked the fact that I ended up on the orangutans and we built a new enclosure in the far corner of the zoo so I could go up there and just hide with my charges and get on with it. The naturalist and author Gerald Darrell inspired a generation of readers with his love of wildlife. Bert, about the um, otters, if we could have a, a sort of cement thing about two three, feet. Two, two, yes, foot two, wide. yes, about three foot wide. The zoo was his ark and home to orangutan since the 1960s. He hoped that they would teach his visitors that their fate is in our hands. If we can indoctrinate people as they come through our gates, if we can indoctrinate them with the idea that it's terribly sad that creatures are being killed all over the world in wow. hundreds of thousands. Mm. And if during the course of our existence we can save one or two species from extinction, then the whole thing will Don't be... be worth it, yes, certainly. The Durrell Wildlife Trust is now an international organization and it supports Ian's work in Sumatra with funding, equipment and publicity. Indonesia is one of those countries where Jersey didn't traditionally have a big uh, role and a big influence, and even today is still not that well known. And I would like to change that and, and by, by showing people by example exactly the kind of things that can be achieved by following Durrell's philosophy. <laughs> After hours of hard driving, Gordon has almost made it to his destination. A boat ride across the river Aceh, welcome relief from the muddy roads. He's come to the jungle reserve where Ian Singleton is waiting to meet him. Morning. Hey, Ian. So how's it going? Good, you. Do you have any trouble on the trip in or what? Oh, no, it was fine. It was Fun? a bumpy ride, but yeah, yeah it's pretty good. Ian is taking Gordon to the site where orangutans who have been rehabilitated in quarantine are finally set free. For me, it's massively exciting. Is it still massively exciting for you to see the finished product? It is. Product? It is, because this is, you know, this is like what the whole thing's about, and I still get a massive kick out of it when I come out here and see sort of Marco and Sangir or somebody hanging around in the trees, and they're behaving just like wild orangutans, and. It, it, it brings it home because when you first meet a lot of these animals, you know, they're little skinny, covered in fungus, chained around their neck, really terrified of people. And then to get them from that stage out through the quarantine and into here and then living as wild orangutans again, you, you feel like all everything you're doing is worthwhile. Yeah? yeah. This is Udin. At about six years old, he was confiscated by police who found him near the Trepa swamps, where he used to live. Ian's team says his home had been burned and cleared for industry, making him vulnerable to the illegal pet trade. Given to Ian's team, Udin has been learning how to feed himself and make nests. Wow, look at that. Oh, he's going to open the door himself again. Whoa, you are very enthusiastic. Udin is one of about 30 orangutans rescued each year by Ian's organization. It's taken two years to get him ready for this, but there's always a risk. I feel much better giving an animal a second chance at a life in the wild, and uh, maybe it's lucky and it makes it, maybe it's not so lucky and it doesn't make it, but I, I feel much better uh, giving them that chance. 
great to see them I out of the cages. I think Udin is in, looks like he's in really good condition as well. Uh -huh. Bright eyes, wet nose, glossy hair. It's the moment Ian's been waiting for. Oh, look at that straight up, yeah? Wow, fantastic, yeah? Look at that. That is brilliant. Up the liana. Go on, off you go, mate. Wow, whole new world. As Udin ventures out to explore his new home, he won't be left to his own devices. Like the other orangutans released here, he has a transmitter chip in his neck so his progress can be tracked. For Ian, new developments are playing a growing role in efforts to save the species. Yeah, there's two, there's two up there. You see that big branch up there? See that, that big branch? Yeah. So that is the signal from one around the time. So who is it? Is it? Nelly. Nelly, yeah. But they're not the only orangutans in the world being closely watched. In Jersey, Annetta and Dana are having one of their regular checkups. Apekeeper Sarah Folks has trained them to position their tummies against the cage so they can be scanned. Obviously scanning an orangutan is a little bit different from a human because an orangutan is not quite as obliging so sometimes you see things that maybe look unusual or you're not expecting to see and that partially can be just because it's the complications and the logistics of trying to scan an animal that's hanging on bars rather than lying down. In April, Annetta gave birth in the middle of the night to a healthy male. He's been named Janto after the release site in Sumatra. Now all eyes are on Dana. Her story is interesting and amazing because she came to Jersey to breed with the male there, Dagu. She did so very quickly and she went full term, eight and a half months with the youngster. It was turned out to be a female but she had a stillborn. The placenta sheared off inside her and we almost lost her as well as the youngster. She was bleeding to death. But this time, medical science is helping Dana. Good girl. Good girl. There's a lot more amniotic fluid than before as well. Would you like me to do anything? No, just keep going. Hold. Hold. Neil McLaughlin operated on her fallopian tubes, so later she could become pregnant. Now he's making sure his patient's latest pregnancy is going to plan. That's the heartbeat. It's a departure from his daily routine at the hospital. It's nice and regular. I was really interested in the breeding program, and because one of my big interests is in fertility, um, and because Durrell is all about breeding endangered species, it, it was just a wonderful place to go and get involved with. There were occasions where they felt that they needed to compare um, with a sort of human doctor, as it were. All's well in the hospital today, but Neil once had to perform an extraordinary operation on an orangutan. She needed an emergency caesarean. I need some oxygen for this baby. Yeah, no oxygen on. Bring the baby over. Neil went up to Durrell to carry out the surgery. As these incredible pictures show, he was able to save the baby. One in five, one in six, okay. So okay. Thankfully, the anatomy was very similar. Um, I'd never done this before, but I just pretended I was operating on one of my human patients that just was a little bit hairier than normal, and it was incredibly similar. We thought initially that maybe the baby wasn't going to survive. We don't even have goals. Yeah. Okay. We're moving. We're moving. Yeah. And after many minutes, when he threw his arms up 
and started uh, crying. There was a great roar from everyone in theatre and uh, it was really a very emotional moment for everyone. I said at the time that it was the greatest day of my life and my wife was not over pleased. <laughs> Jaya is now a healthy nine-year-old and is being taken to a zoo in France to breed. Oh, look at his little chest. <laughs> and now there's concern he might have to do the same operation again, this time for Dana. If we can keep the scanning going and see that the pregnancy is developing as normally as possible, then I think she'll be okay, but we, need, we do need to be prepared for a similar thing to what happened last time. In Sumatra, Gordon is waiting to hear how Dana is. But he's 7,000 miles away, and mobile phones don't work too well out in the jungle. Getting connected is tricky, but not impossible. How are you doing? Everything's going really well. Jack's doing really good. Uh, and he's getting more active. He's looking around more. Oh, fantastic. And Dana? Dana's doing really well as well. She's looking like um, the pregnancy is developing normally. She's um, spending more time sleeping and resting. She's getting increasingly hungry. So I think it's probably pretty soon. OK, yeah, yeah. That's uh, great news. Safe in Jersey or deep in the jungle, both Gordon and Ian are continuing what Gerald Durrell started 50 years ago. So you knew Gerald Durrell? Uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't meet him a lot, but... Uh, I mean, I started in 89, mm. and I was kind of interested in, you know, this idea that you can take a species that's on the brink for relatively little investment compared to some of these big conservation projects, you know, relatively little investment, you can actually save a species from extinction. Recent research says that since 1985, half of Sumatra's rainforest has been lost. Ian has filmed the scale of forest destruction. He says much of it is caused by large industries demanding more land to develop. He believes some of the native species already endangered are being pushed to the brink. The biggest threat to most species right now is, is not hunting uh, and collection. It, it's, it's loss of entire ecosystems. And then by destroying them, you're losing your water sources, your climate regulation, or, and, and a host of other, of other resources. And for me, the aim is to, is to use these species, these iconic species that can get international attention and public support uh, in, in the battle to save the bigger picture, to save whole ecosystems. Now there is another threat on the horizon. More than a million hectares of protected forest in the region where most of the remaining Sumatran orangutans live could be opened up to industry. Conservationists such as Ian fear the animals they work so hard to protect will be left more vulnerable than ever. Gerald Durrell's vision is being put to the test. Campaigners and the regional government disagree over what's planned. The head of forestry for the Aceh region says while no protected land can be used for industry, there is a growing need for human settlements. So I can tell you that we do not issue the land clearing permit or license for palm oil businessmen no permits for mining businessmen or any other businessmen. If you want to convert forest areas into other purposes, it is purely for people's settlement. People need space. Gordon remains unconvinced by assurances from the authorities. He argues industry is competing for the areas of forest the orangutans live in that competition looks like this. Palm oil. 
It's farmed extensively throughout Sumatra, and Indonesia is the world's largest exporter. More than 30 million tons were produced this year. The oil is extracted from the fruit of these trees, and it's used in products from shampoo to biscuits. Indonesia Palm Oil Association says it gives people jobs. It says its members are committed to protecting the environment. But as Gordon travels further in Sumatra, he's worried more industries on this scale could ruin the remaining rainforest. Finding out what's going on on the ground is hard in such a vast country. But there are ways. Just a few miles from Ian's head office near Medan, Graham Usher and David Delator are testing the latest spy technology. Yeah, that should do. They're working with Ian, and today they're testing a mini drone. David and Graham have high hopes. You can use a video camera for spotting fires, encroachment uh, in forest. It has been used in the past for surveying for orangutan nests, which you can see from the air if you fly low, low enough over the forest. The spy plane can travel to remote areas and his onboard camera records the scene below. It's the cutting edge of conservation technology. I see lots of interesting new technologies coming out now, which we will support and try and test and try and refine in the field. But in five to 10 years, I think we're gonna see big advantages from all of these things. These young orangutans are among those made homeless as their habitat disappears. There are many mouths to feed, many infants with no mothers, many very ill. Some of them are just so bad, you know, so critically ill and, and so late in the disease progression that you really haven't got much hope of saving them, you know? whereas other ones you have, and, and you just focus on the ones you can do. It would be amazing to get all of these uh, orangutans back into the wild, but there are ones that can't go back for various reasons. They've been maimed so badly. Losa is blind, permanently blind. Um, and that, that's, that's really sad because it requires full-time care um, from people, and it shouldn't need to. They, they should be able to return to their home where they came from but some can't. Gordon's preparing to say goodbye and head home to Jersey. He has mixed feelings. There are more orangutans here than the last time I visited. There are some extremely sick orangutans being cared for. One has a broken neck. Another one has been bitten by a dog. Um, it's, it's quite tragic, really, to see them. And they are all, as Ian describes them, refugees being looked after in this, this refugee camp. No one knows what future these animals are facing but Ian's not giving up on them. It's like what Gerald Durrell always said, you know, the happiest day of my life would be the day I can close the zoo because it's not needed anymore. Well, the happiest day of my life would be the day I could stop doing this job because I didn't need to do it anymore. Durrell, Jersey. Gordon's back at work. Dana's baby is due any day now. It's been eight and a half months in the waiting but no one quite knows when the baby will come. And worried staff are doing all they can to keep an eye on her. Cameras are recording and sending pictures to the laptops and phones of everyone involved in her welfare. They've been rigged up specially. 
some updating mobiles every 15 seconds. There are hours of anxious watching and waiting. If Dana gives birth to a healthy orangutan in terms of it being miraculous, then I think it's close. If, if you think that most new life is miraculous in itself, then the process that we have gone through so that she is able to conceive is a, a miracle of science. One night in June, staff see her behavior changing. She's preparing her nest. At quarter to midnight, Gordon's patience pays off. Oh, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. This is it, that's the head. That's it, it's out, it's out. That's it. Yes, it's alive, it's moving, it's moving. She's only minutes old. It's life in Dana's arms, when only a few years ago, this new mum faced death. These animals are incredible characters, realizing that their characters are so different, and being able to help them um, is very special, that they're very close to humans. Dana and Annette's babies are growing up. The efforts of Gordon and Neil have helped bring two new babies into the world. She's still learning. She is. Dana and her baby are venturing outside for the first time. But how will Annetta respond to the new addition to the Durrell family? Captive orangutans could become the last of their kind if their relatives die out in Sumatra. Hundreds of species go extinct, but what we're seeing now is an increase in the amount of extinctions that occur. The time frame is shorter, and the reason is us. He's echoing the fears Gerald Durrell raised more than 40 years ago. It's the most incredible, the most beautiful garden. Mm -hmm. And what have we done? We've trampled through it with our great hobnail boots. For better or worse, the Sumatran orangutan is at the mercy of human intervention. Understanding the close links between our species and theirs is the key to their survival. Next on BBC Two, feeling festive? The Great British Bake Off Christmas Masterclass is on the way with how to make the perfect mince pies.